Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second part of this cycle of conferences that brings together under the title Chemistry and Handout Rights to Society, 11 talks related to chemistry, <clears throat> chemical engineering, and biochemistry. Today, on the seventh talk of this semester, we will have the pleasure of listening to Mr. Miguel Gisbert uh, Garzaran, uh, originally from the, uh, from the uh, Chemistry and Pharmaceutical Sciences uh, school, uh, Department in the, in, the, in the School of Pharmacy. Um, the title of the, of the talk is uh, Stimuli Responsive Mesoporous Nanomatrix mat Matrices for Drug Delivery. Uh, as I tried to, to mention when I introduced these, these talks, we opt uh, for the online format instead of face-to-face uh, -face format, because we were in the pandemic context in the, at the beginning, uh, and uh, taking advantage of the platform provided by the, the Fundación General uh, de la UCM, whom I would like to thank uh, once again for the help and support in organizing this activity. This format is more suitable uh, for getting uh, more people to be connected and access uh, to, this, uh, to these talks. I thank also uh, to our funding sources, the Spanish Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Society, the Royal Chemistry Society, Sectorial of Madrid, and Vice Rector of Research and Transfer for their financial support. The choice of the language for this activity deals with the fact that science is mainly written and discussed in English. Our uh, junior researchers join our institution uh, after spending a more or less prolonged uh, period of time abroad. Organizing these webinars in English can even make it easier for them to communicate their scientific results. In this way, we can extend uh, our audience to foreign institutions, which in many cases are those that have hosted these researchers. The lectures will always take place on Thursday at 12.30, and the last one will be on June 2nd. Uh, and each, uh, this, each uh, webinar will be announced uh, at the beginning of the week, including the link for the registration form. Without further ado, I will hand over to the moderator of this talk, Daniel Lozano, professor of the School of Pharmacy also. Uh, professor Lozano will introduce the speaker and moderate the questions that you can write in the preguntas and respuestas box or link that you have at the bottom of your screen. Then Professor Lozano is, uh, is your turn. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Teresa. Um, hi, everyone, everybody. Uh, Miguel Gisbert studied physics at the University of Zaragoza. Then he got a master's degree in biomedical physics at the University of Complutense of Madrid. In 2019, he obtained his PhD in pharmacy from the same university in the group of Maria Valle Regi and the supervision of uh, Dr. Miguel Mantal. He also joined the Institute for Integrated Cell Material Science in Kyoto with the professor uh, Tamahori for a three month predoctoral stay. He carried out a postdoctoral stay at the University of Madrid, though then joined the group of uh, Dr. Julian Nicolas at Institute Galian Paris Sacli in Paris, under the supervision of Dr. Simona Moen. He's currently a postdoc in the group of Dr. Alvaro Somoza at Indea Nanocencia. And uh, for all these years, Miguel has mainly focused on the use of mesoporous nanoparticles for drug delivery against cancer and infection. Although he also worked on the protein corona of polymeric and lipid product nanoparticles. Currently, he's working on functionalized nanoparticles for Duchenne, Duchenne muscular uh, dystrophy. It's okay? <laughs> so, Miguel, uh, it's your turn. Um... Okay, so yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Maria Teresa for organizing uh, all these talks and also Daniel for introducing me. 
So today I'm going to talk about the stimuli responsive mesopolar nanomatrices for drug delivery. So in, in other words, I'm going to talk about nanomedicine or at least uh, a part of nanomedicine. So the, the talk is organized as follows. Uh, I will provide a brief introduction and then I, I will speak about uh, nanoparticles for cancer treatment and finally nanoparticles for antibacterial treatment. Okay, so uh, Attending to the definition, uh, material is considered a nanomaterial if at least one of its dimensions belongs to the nanometric scale. And consequently, uh, nanomedicine uh, will, co will consist of the application of nanomaterials to medicine. Uh, we have many different uh, types of nanoparticles uh, that can be classified uh, very broadly into organic and inorganic nanoparticles. And today I will speak about uh, particular kind of inorganic nanoparticles that are mesopolar nanoparticles. In particular, I will speak about uh, silica and carbon uh, mesopolar nanoparticles. Okay, so uh, generally speaking, uh, these mesopolar nanoparticles are interesting because they are mechanically, thermically, and chemically stable. They also present uh, excellent textural properties, which are beneficial for absorbing drugs uh, uh, within the pores. And also they can be easily uh, modified uh, at the level of the, of the surface. However, uh, because these nanoparticles uh, have op an open porosity, uh, it is very easy to introduce the drugs in the pores, but for the same reason, it is quite easy for the drugs to diffuse out. Uh, if the drugs that we have loaded within the pores diffuse out when, when we place the nanoparticles in the bloodstream, then uh, those drugs are going to affect uh, the healthy tissues and consequently uh, the patient will, will suffer uh, different side effects. Uh, to overcome this issue, we can take advantage of the concept of stimuli responsive gatekeepers. So uh, stimuli responsive gatekeepers are uh, many different types of structures that are, that are able to close the mesopores uh, in physiological conditions uh, the, these gatekeepers can be, for instance, uh, polymers, small nanoparticles, uh, macromolecules, many different types of, of, uh, of structures. So these structures, when we apply uh, a stimulus that can be internal or external, uh, are able to suffer some kind of uh, conformational change. So in the end, uh, the pores open and the drugs can be released. Uh, as I have said, uh, the, this, stimuli, this stimuli can be external or internal. Examples of external stimuli uh, can be, for instance, a magnetic field, a light of different wavelengths, uh, ultrasounds, for instance. And in the case of uh, internal stimuli, uh, I will uh, talk today about uh, variations in pH, uh, the presence of redox environments, and the presence or the overexpression of enzymes. So very briefly, uh, the, the role of pH uh, in nanoparticles for drug delivery is that uh, the bloodstream presents uh, nearly neutral pH, uh, let's say around 7.4. Uh, however, there are some compartments within the cells that are uh, progressively acidic. And these compartments are interesting because uh, nanoparticles, well, they, they, they can enter the cells through different ways, uh, but many of them involve the formation of some vesicles, uh, which are called uh, the endosomes and finally the lysosomes. Uh, and uh, normally cells use these vesicles to introduce nutrients and uh, macromolecules and so on. And inside there is an acidic pH that can, that can degrade those elements. So the, in the end, the cells can use them uh, for eating, let's say eating. Uh, okay, so we can use that to trigger the drug release. Also, uh, in normal cells, uh, the levels of antioxidants and reactive oxygen species are balanced. However, in cancer cells, uh, we observe that there is an overexpression of, of antioxidants, uh, for instance, uh, the well-known glutathione. So it can be used to trigger the, the drug release as well. And finally, regarding the enzymes, uh, it is known that in many diseases, uh, there is an overexpression of enzymes that uh, we wouldn't find in, in that normal tissue, in, in a healthy scenario. And that uh, can also be used to, to trigger the drug release. Okay, so uh, today I will speak about uh, two types of mesopolar nanoparticles, uh, silica nanoparticles and carbon nanoparticles. So let me introduce very briefly how silica and carbon nanoparticles are synthesized. 
So basically, for the synthesis of uh, mesoporous silica nanoparticles, uh, we have a surfactant, uh, we, we, and we, have, uh, we, we need a surfactant, and we need a silica precursor. So this surfactant is going to self-assemble into micelles. So then uh, when we add the silica precursor, it, it will uh, undergo uh, a hydrolysis and condensation around those uh, surfactant micelles. So in the end, we, we will end up uh, with uh, nanoparticles with that surfactant within the pores. So if we want to use those nanoparticles uh, to load them with drugs, uh, we, have, uh, we need to get rid of uh, that surfactant. So uh, uh, we, car uh, we carry out uh, uh, like a final step to remove uh, that, that substance. And in the end, uh, we end up with uh, our mesoporosidic nanoparticles. Uh, I have to say that uh, this uh, synthetic pathway that uh, you are seeing in the screen is a, a particular one uh, to produce MCM41 mesoporosidic nanoparticles. And this is important to note because uh, there are several types of uh, silica nanoparticles, and not all of them are synthesized in the same way. But uh, what it is true is that all of them are synthesized through a salt gel process. OK, so uh, regarding mesoporous silica nanoparticles, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, carbon nanoparticles, so the synthesis is quite similar uh, in the sense that we have to synthesize first uh, mesoporous silica nanoparticles. And then uh, we will use those nanoparticles to infiltrate them with an organic uh, precursor. For instance, in this case, we can use sucrose. So then uh, the, the organic precursor, the precursor is carbonized. And finally, the, the silica uh, backbone is removed. So in the end, uh, we end up with carbon nanoparticles, uh, which can, can be expressed as the negative of the silica template, meaning that where there was a pore in the silica, uh, there will be wall in the carbon nanoparticles, and where there was wall, uh, there will be a pore. Okay, so uh, I, I will show uh, some examples of gatekeepers in this in this talk, and some of them are based on uh, a, a type of chemistry that is known as self emulative chemistry. It's a relatively new uh, type of chemistry. And uh, basically, uh, self-immolative molecules are, are molecules that present a triggering moiety in, in the structure. So when that triggering molecule is removed uh, upon the action of a particular stimulus, for instance, uh, a variation in pH, uh, then uh, there, there is a cascade, an electronic cascade. Uh, so in the end, uh, the polymer, for instance, or, or, or the small molecule, uh, disassemble into its, into its functional units and uh, we can understand this as a domino, uh, meaning that when, when we move one of the, of the pieces, then all of them fall. And uh, this is very useful, not only uh, to produce polymers, as we will see in this, in this talk, uh, but also to produce uh, prodrugs, uh, which are uh, often uh, used in this, in this field of, of nanomedicine. Uh, prodrugs are basically drugs that are inactivated unless some stimulus uh, happens. So in the end, we, we recover the, the original drug. OK, so uh, let's move on to the first part of the, of the talk. I will speak about nanoparticles for cancer treatment. And here, I will speak uh, about two different things. So first, I will show uh, some pH responsive uh, mesoporous nanoparticles uh, based on a self a pH responsive self polymer. And then I, I will speak uh, about a an, nanomaterial an engineered to overcome uh, some biological barriers uh, that nanoparticles encounter when they are placed in the in the bloodstream. And finally, uh, I will speak. Uh, well, I will explain it again later. Anyway, so uh, the the main drawback of conventional chemotherapy is that uh, the doctor administers the drug uh, to the patient, and then because those drugs uh, lack uh, selectivity towards the, the tumor or the tumor tissue. Uh, they end up distributed unevenly throughout the, the entire body. So in, in this sense, uh, the use of nanoparticles uh, might be useful to overcome this issue because, uh, as I have said, we can load uh, different drugs uh, within the nanoparticles. Then we, we can administer intravenously uh, those nanoparticles in the bloodstream. And then, uh, ideally, uh, those nanoparticles will accumulate in, in the tumor. Uh, why uh, those nanoparticles are going to accumulate in the tumor? 
uh, well, there, there is something called the EPR effect, which stands for Enhanced uh, Permeability and Retention Effect. And this is a very characteristic feature of tumors uh, that consists of the fact that uh, tumor tissues are defective and they present uh, very poor lymphatic drainage. And also the blood vessels around the tumor are, are, are leaky, meaning that they have uh, like small holes. So in the end, uh, the combination of those two facts uh, allow us to uh, deliver nanoparticles that will uh, leave the bloodstream and accumulate in the tumor because of those holes that I, 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 I have said. Uh, and then because the, the, the lymphatic drainage is very poor, the, nanopart the nanoparticles will remain uh, for long periods of, periods of time in the, in the tumor. Okay, so in the, in the first example that I'm going to talk about, uh, we focused on designing uh, MCM41 mesoporosilica nanoparticles engineered uh, with the uh, pH responsive self immolative polymer. So the objective here was to verify that uh, this self immolative technology uh, was actually uh, a, a good way to uh, prevent premature drug release and allow it only inside the cells. Okay, so. Uh, for this gatekeeper, we employed this polymer that you are seeing now. So uh, this is a self-immolative polyurethane that is based on amino benzyl alcohol. So uh, in the absence of uh, acid environment, uh, it, it has an average molecular weight of around 3K. Uh, but then uh, when we subjected it to an acid environment, uh, we, we can see that the, the structure is completely lost. So in fact, we have a, a polymer that uh, is degrading uh, in the presence of, of acid environment. Okay, so uh, for the functionalization of the nanoparticles, uh, because uh, the silica nanoparticles uh, present many, many uh, silanol groups on the surface, uh, a very common approach to functionalize silica is to use uh, alkoxy silence within some kind of functional uh, moiety. For instance, in this case, uh, we have a chlorine group, but we have we can have an amino group, a carboxylic acid, uh, many different things. So in this case, uh, we used uh, this uh, alkoxy silane, and then uh, we added the self immolative polymers, uh, which are referred to as uh, SIPs uh, uh, many times throughout the talk. So basically, uh, we added the alcohol of the uh, self immolative polymers to this alkoxy silane, and then uh, we got our zip coated mesoporous silica nanoparticles. Okay, so uh, in general, silica nanoparticles can be characterized using uh, different uh, techniques. So for instance, the X-ray diffraction allow us to see the symmetry of the pores and, and allow us to check that the, th that symmetry is preserved throughout the different uh, functionalization steps. Uh, uh, the thermogrammetric analysis is also very useful because uh, we can see if after each character, uh, functionalization step, uh, there is an increase in the presence of organic matter, which would mean that uh, we have, uh, in fact, incorporated a, a, an alkoxy silane, an organic alkoxy silane, or an organic polymer, for instance. Uh, it is also very useful, the Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy, because uh, it allows us to, to check uh, variations uh, in the presence or the intensity of the different functional groups. Uh, in the nanoparticles. Uh, also, the nitrogen absorption porosimetry is very useful because uh, it, it gives us uh, the textural properties of the nanoparticles, meaning the, sur the specific surface area, the pore volume, or the pore diameter, among others. And also, uh, with dynamic light scattering, uh, we can also check uh, how these nanoparticles behave uh, in, in aqueous solution. In this case, I'm, I'm only showing uh, the pristine nanoparticles, but it can be it can be done for all the all the groups. Okay, so after functionalizing the nanoparticles and characterizing them and and checking that uh, okay we have this polymer around the nanoparticles, but it, it, is it actually uh, sensitive to to acid pH or not? So uh, to to answer the question, uh, we we took our nanoparticles and we placed them in two different solutions, one at pH seventy point four which could be uh, that of the, the, the pH of the bloodstream, and another one at pH 5, which would be the pH of the lysosomes. And as you can see in the, in the graph, uh, it is clear that there is a huge difference in the release uh, uh, at both pHs. And uh, this can be understood as that at physiological pH, uh, the self-immolative polymer 
uh, remains unaffected. So it, it closes the mesopores of the nanoparticles. So the, 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 the payload uh, remains inside. However, at pH five, it self immolates. So th th there is nothing on the surface that prevents the drug from going out. So in the end, we have this, this drug release. So we can conclude that uh, this self immolative technology can indeed be used uh, as gatekeeper for, for mesopore nanoparticles. And th this is, this isn't an obvious thing because uh, we were the, the first to, to prove this like ever. So this was very good news. Uh, so after that, uh, we carried out a very preliminary uh, biological experiments. So uh, we tested uh, if our nanoparticles were set toxic to healthy cells. And for that, we incubated our nanoparticles with periosteoblastic cells. And as you can see, uh, the nanoparticles uh, were not cytotoxic. Uh, not even at very high concentrations. Uh, so that would, that's good news again. And also uh, we checked that uh, our zip coated nanoparticles could be internalized by, by uh, prostate cancer cells. Okay, so so far uh, we have demonstrated that we, ha we have this self immolative technology that can be used to, to uh, close the pore entrances. So after that, and, and because I, I did my thesis uh, in the framework of a European project uh, that involved the use of carbon nanoparticles, uh, we, we tried to translate such technology into the carbon nanoparticles. So uh, the, the idea of the project uh, is basically the same. Uh, we wanted to synthesize nanoparticles, loaded them with a payload, uh, coating them with a self immolative polymer and check uh, whether, there, whether there is release or not in the absence uh, or presence of the stimulus. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, instead of MCM41 uh, silica, we employed two different types of carbon nanoparticles, uh, the CNK1, which comes from MCM48 uh, silica, and the CNK3, which comes from SVA15 silica. And we, we can consider them as small and, and big, of course, all of them are small, but uh, the, the C1 nanoparticles, uh, we will see that are around the 100 uh, nanometers and the other one are more in the micro size. Okay, so uh, why are these uh, carbon nanoparticles interesting? Uh, well, uh, in general, these carbon nanoparticles present uh, much better textural properties than, than silica. Uh, so we wanted to, to know if, okay, we have better textural properties, but uh, we have, do, do we have uh, better loading capacities? Uh, as you can see here, uh, it is clear that uh, we, we, we have uh, better loading capacities. So this, this was a very uh, good starting point uh, for, for, for this work. Okay, so uh, these carbon nanoparticles uh, can also be characterized uh, using more or less the same techniques. Uh, they also present a symmetry uh, at the pore level. Uh, they, they, they have these uh, great textural properties that I was saying, uh, and also they can be visualized using different le electronic microscopic techniques. So in the end, we can conclude that we have uh, the C3 carbons uh, that have a hexagonally ordered structure with cylindrical mesopores that are in the micron size and, the, and that present excellent textural properties. And also that we have these uh, C1 uh, carbons with a three-dimensional cubic structure with narrow uh, mesoports, uh, excellent textural properties as well, and a size of around 150 nanometers. Okay, so uh, we analyzed these carbon nanoparticles with XPS uh, to check uh, what functional groups uh, did we have in the, uh, on the surface. And we conclude that the, the most abundant functional groups uh, was the, the epoxy groups. So we took advantage of that to, to add the, the self-immolative polymer and functionalize the nanoparticles. So again, uh, we characterize the nanoparticles. Uh, we can see here uh, an increase in the, in the weight loss after the functionalization steps. Uh, again, uh, a reduction in the textural properties uh, after the functionalization steps, which is indicative of the presence of something that is uh, covering the surface. Uh, also, uh, using again the XPS, uh, we could observe the presence that, uh, of signals that were ascribed to the carbamate of the self immolative polymers. And in, in addition, uh, uh, this is interesting because uh, using the electronic microscope, the, the transmission electronic microscope, uh, not only can we observe the nanoparticles, but we can also observe 
if there is organic uh, matter on the samples, and this can, this can be done uh, using uh, phosphotunstic acid, which is a compound that stains the organic matter. So again, we could see the, the organic matter. Uh, and yeah, this, this is also very interesting because carbon nanoparticles are very hydrophobic, uh, meaning that uh, it is nearly impossible to disperse them in, in water. So it was very difficult for us to carry out the dynamic light scattering experiments, or in other words, the, the colloidal stability in water. But it is interesting because after functionalizing the nanoparticles with the seed coating, uh, it was much easier and we, we, we obtained a much better results. So we can conclude that the seed coating uh, improved the colloidal properties of our nanoparticles. Okay, so after fun uh, functionalizing and characterizing the nanomaterials, uh, we carried out again uh, a release experiment. And uh, again, uh, using physiological pH and acid pH to mimic the pH of the lysosomes of the cells. And again, as you can observe, uh, in the absence of acid, of acid, uh, pH, uh, acid pH, uh, the, the polymers could block the release. So they, they were effectively closing the, the mesopores. Uh, but uh, at acid pH, again, uh, we, we could see the, the, a, a very drastic release. So this means that uh, we can translate uh, the technology, the cellulative technology from silica nanoparticles to, to carbon nanoparticles without losing any of the, of the functionality. Okay, so after that, uh, we carried out a preliminary uh, cytotoxicity experiment using doxorubicin with, with human osteosarcoma cells. And here uh, we had uh, three different groups. Uh, so the, the control is just cells, so no, no particles. And then uh, we had uh, nanoparticles functionalized with the polymer, but without drugs. Uh, then nanoparticles with the polymer and with doxorubicin, which is a, a, an anti-cancer drug. And finally, uh, nanoparticles with doxorubicin and uh, with a polymer that contained the same structure, but without the pH responsive moiety. So in theory, uh, we, we were expecting no release from these uh, nanoparticles. So as you can observe in the graph, uh, it is clear that only in the case uh, where there was the pH responsive trigger, we could observe the, 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 the viability, a, a decrease in the viability of the, of the cells. So uh, we can conclude that if there is a trigger, there will be cell stimulation, so there will be release and there will be cell death. But uh, in the opposite case, if there is no trigger, there won't be cell stimulation, there won't be release, so cells uh, will, will, will stay alive. Okay, so uh, taking, taking into account everything that I have shown, uh, we, could, we could complete conclude that the C1 uh, nanoparticles, the zip-coated C1 nanoparticles, uh, were the best candidate uh, because they had the, the, the better, the best textural properties. Uh, they, they showed the best release profile and uh, they showed the greatest cytotoxic effects. So after that, uh, we carried out a uh, in view proof of concept study uh, that was conceived to answer these three questions. Okay, so first question, uh, will the seed coated nanoparticles induce an immune response if we administer them subcutaneously in, in, a, in a mice. Okay, so here we have uh, many things. Let's focus here. So we have one and two. Two indicates uh, the site of injection, and one uh, it's a random point uh, where, where we know that uh, nanoparticles are going to be there. So uh, if, we, if we do a crop, uh, it is clear that in the injection site, uh, uh, there are many, many uh, immune cells, uh, which is logic uh, because, I mean, it's a needle. So uh, that's the, the response of the, of the organism uh, against that. Uh, however, if we look at the nanoparticles, uh, we can see that the immune response, which is there, of course, uh, is quite low and is comparable uh, to the case of uh, an animal that didn't receive any injection. So we can conclude that our nanoparticles uh, are biocompatible. So after that, uh, we wanted to answer this question, if the zip coating will remain unaffected uh, in the mice in the absence of acid, st uh, acid stimuli. So for that, uh, we loaded the nanoparticles with a ruthenium dye 
and then uh, we administer the nanoparticles uh, in a pocket under the skin of the of the animals and and then uh, we imaged them for up to 96 hours and as you can observe uh, the fluorescence intensity in all cases uh, was always low uh, meaning that the uh, seed coating remain unaffected in a in a more complex in vivo scenario, and that the seed coating uh, coating uh, was able to uh, keep the the ruthenium dye within the pores. So after that, okay, uh, we know the nanoparticles are biocompatible. Uh, we know that uh, they they remain unaffected uh, in physiological conditions. But what happens if we have an acid scenario? So for that. Uh, we, we, we did this experiment, so we have two groups. Uh, in this one, uh, we have animals uh, that uh, received the nanoparticles uh, at physiological pH. And here uh, we had uh, some animals that received the nanoparticles in an acid solution. They, they got uh, three injections of acid solution for 30 minutes. And uh, we observed that just uh, 30 minutes of exposition to acid pH was more than enough to trigger the drug release. It is clear that in the case of uh, a physiological pH, the, the, the dye remain uh, confined within the pores, within the nanoparticles. However, when, when we have these acid pH, uh, the, again, the, the polymer self immolates, uh, the, the pores open, and then the, the payload, in this case, the ruthenium dye, uh, can be released. So in summary, uh, to finish with this, with this part of the talk, uh, we can conclude that uh, these kind of zip coated nanocarriers are biocompatible. Uh, also that uh, this uh, self immolative technology uh, is strong enough to be administered uh, to an animal uh, and, and remain unaffected without undergoing self immolation. And also uh, that if uh, we subject this uh, material to an acid pH, it will release uh, the payload. Uh, so in other words, if uh, we use in the future this, this uh, nanomaterial to treat a tumor, uh, the nanoparticles uh, will be internalized by the tumor, tumoral cells. And then uh, in the lysosomes where we, we have this acid pH, uh, this, the self immolative coating will degrade and then uh, the chemotherapeutics will diffuse out and will hopefully uh, eliminate the tumor. Okay, so uh, now I will I will talk about um, biological barriers to cancer treatment. So uh, basically, there are many barriers to to nanoparticles, uh, especially in, in in the case of uh, cancer drug, de drug delivery. Uh, very briefly, the most important are opsonizations, opsonization, uh, which means that uh, when nanoparticles are administered to a, a in, into a into a patient. Uh, there, there are many different proteins in the bloodstream in the bloodstream. So some of those proteins will absorb on the surface and depending on the nature of those proteins, uh, the, the immune system will recognize the, the nanoparticles and will be removed from the organism. Also, uh, we, we have the risk that nanoparticles do not accumulate in the tumor. Uh, also, we have the risk that uh, given that we have an open porosity, uh, the, the, the drug will diffuse out. Uh, also, uh, it is quite difficult for nanoparticles to go to deeper areas of the tumor because of the uh, dense collagen matrix and the, and the high pressure that there is there. And finally, uh, nanoparticles don't have uh, cancer cell selectivity and they can be uh, degraded into, into the lysosomes if they don't escape them. Okay, so in, in this work, uh, we focused on, on dealing uh, with those four. So for that, uh, we engineered this system. So basically we have, again, MCM41 uh, mesoporosilica nanoparticles that are functionalized with a redox responsive self cumulative linker, which is this molecule. So these molecules, this molecule is uh, multifunctional, uh, meaning that uh, it can, it can uh, slow down uh, premature drug release and also it provides reactive points for further functionalization. And then we have polyethylene glycol, which is a very biocompatible uh, polymer. And finally, we have uh, this key. So this key is this molecule. This molecule is a multifunctional molecule that has, that has two, uh, two parts. Uh, one is this one composed of histidines, which is an amino acid known to, known to induce the endosomal escape uh, within the cells. And, and then we have this part, uh, 
uh, which is a biotin molecule, which is a targeting moiety because uh, there are some cancer cells that overexpress the biotin receptors. Uh, the interesting thing about this uh, is that we can tune on demand uh, this part of the molecule. So for instance, we, we could use folic acid because uh, the folic acid receptor is also very expressed in, in cancer cells, or we could use peptides. It's quite versatile. Okay, so uh, a bit of characterization. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the self immolative molecule was able to slow down premature drug release. So uh, after that, uh, we moved to the uh, cellular experiments. And, and here we, we did uh, three different things. We evaluated the, the cancer cell targeting ability, we evaluated the endosomal escape, and then finally the cytotoxicity. Uh, for the cancer cell targeting, we had three different groups, uh, the, 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 the nanoparticles without the peptide, the nanoparticles with the peptide, and the nanoparticles without the histidine molecules, but with the, with the biotin. And uh, as you can see here, only in the case where we had the complete system, uh, meaning the histidine uh, motifs plus the, the biotin targeting uh, molecule, only in this case, uh, we could observe uh, this uh, high internalization in cancer cells. Uh, this was done with HeLa cells, in fact. Okay, so after that, uh, we, we tried to check if uh, we could induce the endosomal escape. And for that, uh, we, we carried out uh, an experiment with calcine. So calcium is a membrane impermeable molecule. So if uh, we add calcium to cells, it, it won't go into the cells. So uh, we can see here uh, black, so no, no calcium inside. If uh, we introduce um, mesoporous silicon nanoparticles without any functionality and calcium, uh, we, we will see small dots of calcium. And the reason for this is that calcium, one of the properties of calcium is that uh, when it is at a very high concentration, it, it self quenches, so we can't see its fluorescence. However, uh, when, when the concentration is not so high, uh, we can see the fluorescence again. And this is what happens in the case where we have this complete system with this molecule that is able to induce the endosomal escape. So after that, uh, this is a uh, two dimensional cell experiment. So we moved two three-dimensional experiments. So we, we grow um, A549 a cancer cell spheroids, and we carried out the same experiments. And as we can see here, uh, it is clear that only in the case where we had the complete system, uh, we were able to, to see the fluorescence from calcine. So uh, we, we checked again uh, the endosomal escape capabilities of the system. Uh, also, this is quite interesting because we observed uh, improved penetration towards inner areas of the spheroid in the case where, where, we, where we had the complete system. Uh, also, uh, in the case of cytotoxicity, uh, well, I didn't mention before, but it is clear that the targeted system, in other words, the targeting that is, that is able to accumulate more in cancer cells induced the higher toxicity here in, in orange. It happened the same uh, to the spheroids, and uh, we can represent it visually or numerically, uh, both graphs represent the same. Uh, yeah. So after that, uh, once we have evaluated in vitro a nanomaterial, the, the, the logical step, next step, uh, seems to be an animal. However, uh, there are some problems with uh, animal experiments. Uh, the first one is that uh, you have to fill in many, many legal documents uh, because of ethical issues, of course. Uh, and then uh, you have to, to take uh, several courses and you, you, you have to, to know very well what you are doing with the, with the animals. So it's quite difficult to work with them. So here, we, what we did, this, this was done in, in Japan, in Kyoto. Uh, we worked with a chicken embryo model. So what we did here uh, was to, uh, to grow a tumor uh, on the cor coralantoic membrane of the of the chicken embryos, as you see here. So basically, uh, this is not an animal yet. If we use it uh, up to day uh, 18 or 20, I, I can't remember right now. Uh, so basically, uh, we can use this uh, without any eth ethical concerns, and it provides us uh, quite useful information about the nanomaterial. So uh, as we can observe here, we were able to grow a tumor. 
uh, the nanoparticles accumulated in the tumor because the nanoparticles were labeled with a, with a red dye, with rhodamine. And also, if we look at the, at the organ distribution of the, of the chicken embryo, uh, it is clear that the majority of the nanoparticles accumulated in the tumor with only mineral accumulation in, in the kidneys and, and in the liver. And this is very important because this means that uh, our nanoparticle, nanoparticles, uh, first of all, uh, were stable enough to circulate for up to 48 hours, more, more or less, uh, to accumulate in the tumor without causing any uh, stroke or whatever. So they were uh, colloidally stable. And also uh, because they accumulated mainly in the tumor, that means that the protein corona that they acqu acquired uh, was not uh, a bad, let's say, protein corona, but a good one. Uh, th this is important because there are two types of proteins, very broadly, uh, opsonins and disopsonins. So if a nanoparticle uh, gets opsonins, uh, the, 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 the immune system will recognize them. And if not, uh, it won't. So it is more likely that it will accumulate in the tumor. Okay, so after checking that the nanoparticles uh, could accumulate in the tumor, uh, we loaded the nanoparticles with doxal rubicin, uh, and then uh, we did a, a, a tumor el elimination experiment. And as you can see here, it is clear that in the case of uh, our system, our complete system loaded with doxal rubicin, we could uh, reduce the the grow the, the weight of the tumor, which was a, mac a macroscopic tumor, uh, quite big. Uh, by 50% in just 72 hours. Okay, so uh, enough uh, about cancer treatment. So no, now I, I will speak uh, a bit about nanoparticles for antibacterial treatment. So I will uh, speak about a system uh, for treating osteomyelitis provoked by E. coli, and then uh, a bit about osteomyelitis provoked by, by Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, so. Uh, in this case, uh, in, the, in the first case, uh, for the treatment of uh, osteomyelitis induced by uh, E. coli, uh, we designed this, this system. So ba basically, we have MCM41, mesopore silicon nanoparticles, loaded with an antibiotic, which is moxifloxacin. Uh, and then uh, on the surface, it was functionalized with Arabic gum and colistin, which is another antibiotic. So uh, let, let me tell you, uh, first of all, that the, the original idea was to engineer a gatekeeper with the Arabic gum. Uh, but for that, uh, we, have, we had to use a lot of, Arab, of, of Arabic gum. Uh, but luckily, as we will see now, uh, the use of a slightly less amount of Arabic gum, uh, okay, it just slowed down the drug release, which is not so bad, uh, by the way. But the, the, the important thing is that it endowed the nanoparticles with affinity for the bacterial biofilm. So the, the biofilm, uh, very briefly, is uh, a state of the bacterial growth uh, in which they, they are basic, basically confined uh, within a polymeric mesh. Uh, and so in, in, in summary, they are in, in that state, they are resistant to antibiotics and they are more uh, difficult to eliminate. Okay, so we characterized the nanoparticles uh, using uh, the same techniques that we have been using so far. And we carried out uh, different experiments with bacteria. So first of all, uh, we, we checked whether this Arabic gum could be employed uh, as a carbon source by the bacteria. In other words, if bacteria could degrade this uh, Arabic gum. And as we can see here, it is clear that it, 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 it can. Uh, because only in the case where there was Arabic gum in the medium, uh, there, there, there was an increment in the number of bacteria. Uh, also, uh, we, we could check that the uh, bacteria could degrade this Arabic gum coating uh, because here we can see a small difference between the non-coated and the coated uh, with Arabic gum nanoparticles in the release. But uh, in this case, the release uh, is the same. So that means that the nanoparticles are uh, the, the, the coating of the nanoparticles is, is being degraded by bacteria. And here is the, the, the experiment that I was uh, talking about previously. This is very interesting because uh, we could observe that uh, the, the, the look at the at the blue one, please. Uh, in the case of nanoparticles, 
coated with Arabic gum, uh, we observed that uh, there was a, st a statistically significant uh, increase of the amount of uh, nanoparticles retained on the bacterial biofilm. And this is important because, uh, okay, in the case of cancer treatment, uh, we said that nanoparticles can be administered intravenously because they accumulate in the, in the tumor due to this EPR effect. Uh, however, mm, it's quite hard to administer nanoparticles intravenously and then expect that they, they will accumulate in, in, in an infected area because we don't have the same uh, features, physiological features. So uh, in this sense, and for the case of osteomyelitis, for instance, it is very interesting uh, if we administer the nanoparticles locally via an injection in infected bone. So if we have something on the surface that will attach to the bacterial biofilm, this means that if we add our nanoparticles into the bone, uh, those nanoparticles will remain in the, in the infected area because they will attach to the bacterial biofilm. In other words, uh, we will get a high concentration of our nanoparticles because they won't leave uh, the, the, the infected area. And this is good because if they uh, remain in the infected area, uh, they can uh, exert the antibacterial effect. Okay, and finally, uh, we did some experiments with plan planktonic bacteria, which are bacteria that are not in a biofilm state. And we could see that the, the viability of the, of the bacteria uh, decreased in the presence of the nanoparticles coated with Arab Arabicam and also colistin, because colistin is also an, an antibiotic. Okay, so uh, regarding the, the treatment of the infection, uh, we carried out uh, two different experiments, one in vitro and one in vivo, I, I will show it later. Uh, and we used two models of a uh, bone, on, of infected bone. Uh, for, for the first one, uh, the in vitro model, uh, we used trabecular bone that was infected uh, with, uh, with E. coli. And as we can see here, uh, we evaluated two concentrations of our nanomaterial, and both of them were able to reduce the, the number of, of uh, bacteria, but especially the, the, higher, the highest concentration was able to reduce it uh, almost completely. And all these pictures that you see here uh, is the graphic representation of these results. As you can see here, in the absence of nanoparticles, uh, we just have bacteria uh, that is proliferating. And then uh, in the case of the low concentration, uh, we can observe less bacteria, but, but especially in the case of high concentration, uh, this is a representative uh, area where there, there were still bacteria because in general, it was super hard uh, to find mm, infected areas because the treatment was quite effective. Okay, so then uh, we carried out a uh, in vivo experiment uh, with a rabbit. So uh, we introduced uh, a piece of metal, of infected metal in the femur of the rabbit, and then we administered the nanoparticles. And as we can see here, uh, our nanoparticles were able to reduce uh, significantly the, the, the bacterial infection in the animals. Okay, so uh, I will finish uh, with this uh, work. I, I will say just very few things because we just submitted it. So it's a bit in the open yet, uh, but let, let, me, let me explain it a bit. So uh, in this case, in, instead of, uh, so we, we can see here we have moxifloxacin, which is an antibiotic and rifampicin, which is another antibiotic. So uh, there are many people that co-load the nanoparticles within the pores and I mean, that, that's a, a strategy that can be done, but uh, it is also true that if we collode uh, molecules within the pores, then we don't know if those molecule, molecules are going to interact with each other, if uh, they, they are not going to leave the pores. So it's not that straightforward. So in this case, uh, we designed two sets of nanoparticles, one of them being mostifloxacin and the other one being rifampicin. And, and then each of them was functionalized with a gelatin containing colistin, and then the whole layer was functionalized with an exapeptide of aspartic acid because it presents affinity uh, towards bone. Uh, so why gelatin? Uh, well, because uh, it can be degraded by enzymes, by different enzymes. And in particular, in, it can be degraded by uh, uh, the set of bacterial proteases that are secreted by Staphylococcus aureus. 
Okay, so uh, as we can see here, uh, this uh, polymeric coating that we engineered was able to uh, prevent premature drug release to, to slow down it in the absence of any uh, bacteria. However, when we incubated the nanoparticles with the bacteria, uh, those uh, bacteria were secreting uh, these bacterial proteases. And in this case, there was no difference in the release from the naked nanoparticles or the coating nanoparticles. So in other words, we can conclude that uh, the, the infected or the infection scenario uh, can trigger the degradation of this polymeric layer and it can trigger the, the, the release of antibiotics. Okay, so I, I will finish very briefly uh, by showing uh, some pictures of the bond, bond targeting capability of the nanoparticles. So first, we carried out again the, the in vitro experiment uh, with the trabecular bone. And as we can see, only in the case where, where we have this D6, D6 stands for the exapeptide uh, of polyaspartic acid, uh, only in the case where we had this bone targeting moiety, we could observe the presence of uh, nanoparticle aggregates around the bone. However, when we just had uh, the nanoparticles uh, with the, uh, without the, the targeting, the bone targeting, uh, we did not observe anything. So, uh, because the bone targeted uh, nanoparticles were the best, uh, we, we employed them for the in vivo experiment. And here we administer them into the into the femur of the of the rabbits, and as you can see here, uh, they were able to remain in the femur for even twenty four hours, which is uh, long enough for the antibiotics to be to be released and exert the antibacterial uh, effect. So finally, uh, we tested the 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 in vivo antibacterial effect. Uh, let's look at this one. Uh, we can observe that. The, the nanoparticles, the combination of the nanoparticles loaded with uh, either uh, moxifloxacin or rifampicin uh, were able to decrease the, the number of bacteria. So in the end, we can conclude that uh, this might be uh, a promising strategy to, to deal with a, a, a hard to treat disease as osteomyelitis. And with this, uh, I, will, I, I would like to thank you, all of you for listening. And also, I would like to thank uh, all the institutions that I have worked with, especially the, the group of Professor Maria Valle Trejí, in which I did my PhD thesis, and of course, all, all the rest of uh, collaborators. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. I have one question here. Yes. Because I, I don't have clear how, because you say that the, the nanoparticles are directed uh, specifically to the tumor. Uh, yes. Without any target, any, any ligand that can bind to the to a target of the, the tumoral cells, uh, then how is the, the how is possible that 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 the, I, I, maybe I, I you you say that you, you tell something about but I, I couldn't understand how this the, the nanoparticles go directly to the tumor and not to other kind of tissues. Uh, yes, that's a, a very good question. It's probably the, the most important question in uh, nanoparticles for cancer treatment. So uh, we could say that we have two types of, of targeting. We have the passive targeting and, and the active targeting. So the, the passive targeting relies on the EPR effect and the active targeting relies on employing molecules that, presents, uh, that present affinity for the, for the tumoral cells. Uh, it is also true that there, there are some uh, active targeting moieties that can direct the nanoparticles specifically to the tumor tissue. But generally speaking, uh, when people say active targeting, they are referring to, for instance, uh, um, functionalizing the nanoparticles with an RGD peptide, uh, which has affinity for the alpha beta integrins, for instance. Okay, so uh, so I think your, your question is more about the EPR effect. So. Uh, nanoparticles can spontaneously accumulate in the in the tumors because of this EPR effect, and uh, this is because uh, so in in normal well we have two phenomena here. So in in normal blood vessels, uh, the the walls are are very tight. Let's say so the, the cells are let's say like this. Uh, so nanoparticles can't uh, go leak out from the from the vessels. However, in the case of tumors, uh, instead of having 
like vessels like this, we, we, we have them, let's say like this. So we have these holes, so nanoparticles can leak out through them. Okay, so that would be the first step. If nanoparticles uh, go through a, a, an area where uh, the, 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 the walls are defective like this, they will go out. Uh, but then, uh, I mean, they, they could go in again at some point. But the thing is that uh, in tumors, the lymphatic drainage is quite bad. So that means that uh, waste and so on uh, is more difficultly removed from the, from the tumor. So it happens the same uh, with the nanoparticles. If uh, our nanoparticles can accumulate in the tumor, because the tumor is not very good at removing things, they will remain there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we understand by passive targeting and spontaneous accumulation. However, uh, I, I, I have to say that uh, the, the EPR effect is somehow controversial because, uh, I mean, if, if we were rabbits, uh, we, we won't have any diseases because in, in rabbits or mice, everything works. Uh, but the thing is, uh, not all tumors in, in patients, in human patients, I, I, I mean, uh, present this EPR effect. And not all of them that present the EPR effect, uh, then the EPR effect is strong enough to, to induce the, the accumulation of nanoparticles. So uh, th this is a tool that we have there, uh, but maybe uh, we should um, work toward um, enhancing the, the, the effect of the APR effect. And in that way, I, I think that marketed nanomedicine could increase the, the efficacy. But anyway, you inject the, the nanoparticles, so the, the, the sample, you, you inject the sample near the tumor? Or, not, or no? not necessarily. I mean, in, in our case, for instance, uh, we, we employed uh, a vein that was quite far from the tumor because we wanted to demonstrate the accumulation via the EPR effect. But for, for instance, uh, in, in the place where I'm working now, uh, they, they are carrying out uh, a study with patients and they, and they inject the nanoparticles directly in the pancreas, for instance. So they don't need this uh, intravenous administration. So it, it depends on, on what you want to treat. And I have another question. I mean, these nanoparticles, uh, uh, do you avoid the, the hydrophobicity with the coat that, the coat that you put in, into uh, the nanoparticle, no? Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no aggregation of these nanoparticles at all when you inject these, these, these uh, particles into the, into the blood, well, into the, 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 the body of the, of the, of the my, mouse or whatever. Uh, th that's not an easy question uh, because, I mean, for instance, in, in the case of the chicken embryo, uh, we observed that uh, the nano, I, I mean, uh, first of all, the chicken embryo survived. So that means that the, 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 there weren't any thrombus or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so in that case, we, we can say for sure that the, the nanoparticles were stable enough and they won't form any aggregate. They, they, they didn't form any aggregates. Uh, for the case of the carbon nanoparticles, I, I can't say that because uh, we haven't done intravenous administration. Uh, but again, uh, we don't necessarily have to administer the, nanopar the nanoparticles intravenously because maybe we have some nanoparticles that are very, very good uh, for some applications, but not for others. For instance, uh, if your nanoparticles are not so stable, Maybe instead of uh, administering them intravenously, you can engineer a patch uh, for treating uh, cutaneous or subcutaneous diseases. Uh, so it, 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 again, it depends on the application. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if Daniel has some questions. I don't have any more, more questions. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Miguel, uh, thank yeah. you for such uh, interesting talk with so many results, so congratulations. So I have a question, a general question, uh, that is, uh, in what regulatory situation are the mesoporous silica nanoparticles? Uh, can you repeat, please? In what regulatory situation about FDA or something like that? You know what is the situation? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, currently uh, the, na the, the nanomedicines that are already approved are, and that are being used in the clinics are basically liposomes and polymeric nanoparticles 
or, mm -hmm. or pro protein nanoparticles. Uh, so, so far, uh, silica hasn't reached the clinic. Uh, but for instance, uh, I can tell you that there, there are some uh, phase three, if I'm not wrong, experiments with a type of silica nanoparticles, uh, which are called um, C dots, uh, cornet dots, something like that. Uh, so basically they are very small uh, silica nanoparticles that are used uh, for imaging uh, of tumors. And I, I know that uh, that is, is being done currently, but uh, in, in, in this case, in the case of mesoporous silica, uh, I, I think that there is a still uh, many work to do, but I mean, we okay. are. Do you think they, are, they? Do you think they will be used at some point in the clinic, or maybe, maybe? Why not? I mean, uh, the, the, everything has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for instance, liposomes are, uh, are quite weak, uh, but at the same time are very very stable. So. Uh, for instance, in the case of silica, uh, they are very robust. You can do whatever you want on the, on the surface and they, they, they won't uh, break. So the, again, depending on the application, they might be useful for, for some treatments. Yeah, we, go. we hope so. <laughs> I hope, I hope. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Miguel, because it was a very nice talk. Um, I, I want to thank also to Daniel for the, this introduction. And I want to thank to the audience because uh, to, for attending this, this talk. And I, I, I encourage to, to attend to the next one. It's going to be in May 5th. It's going, uh, I mean, the, the, the but we search is going to be Fernando Martinez Pedrero from the physical chemistry department. And he's going to talk about micro robots propelling through a liquid, a fantastic voyage. Then I think that is going to be a very interesting talk, of course. Then thank you again and, and bye everybody.